Hey, don't push her. I can push by one. You can't push if you want. This is my classroom. She, was looking at me. she wasn't looking at you, she was looking at me. Do you ever have days when the kids seem totally out of control? Did you get in trouble yesterday? She was in trouble yesterday. You see? I mean, is this unproductive or what? When adults argue, we play by the rules. Kids don't. It's like gorilla arguing. Our kids, kids don't play by the rules. Educator Rick Lavoie will help change your child's behavior by changing your behavior at home and in school. Parents and teachers, join us for When the Chips Are Down with Richard Lavoie. Funding for this program is made possible by the members of WETA. From the campus of Georgetown University, please welcome Rick Lavoie. I was speaking in North Carolina not too long ago and I was flying back from North Carolina heading into Boston and you know you're sitting in the back of the plane and coach and you're, you've paid for 18 inches of space, it's like your little world and you kind of sit there protecting it, hovering over it. The gentleman next to you could be having a heart attack, you wouldn't even notice it, you're just kind of sitting there doing your work. So I reached into my briefcase and opened up my briefcase and took out some educational journals I had, dropped the tray table down and took out some note cards and started taking some notes from these journals. There was a middle-aged gentleman sitting right to my left, and he leaned over into my space and saw what I was doing, and he said, excuse me, he said, are you in education? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, do you have any children of your own? And I said, yes, I do, I have three. And with that, it was very strange, it was almost mystical, his eyes kind of glazed over, and he looked out the window of the plane, not focusing on anything, and said half out loud and half to himself, I didn't even know if he was talking to me, he said, God, I wish I had three kids. I'd give anything to have three kids. And I said, don't you have any children, sir? And he said, yes, I have six. The... <laughs> the, po the point being, it's difficult to parent, and it's getting more and more difficult. And it's particularly difficult if you are a parent or a professional dealing with children with learning disabilities. This series that we're putting together for PBS has as its slogan, learning disabilities, the real challenge is educating those who don't have one because it's our bias that we know how to educate this child. We know how to teach the learning disabled child. Now we've got to get to the parents, to the special ed teachers, to the regular ed teachers, to the basketball coaches, religious education teachers. Now we've got to get to the people that deal with those kids every day. I was speaking at a wonderful little school called the Churchill School in St. Louis, Missouri, independent school, small private school for kids with learning disabilities. Had a big audience coming in, about 500 folks coming to hear me speak. And a friend of mine had made, I've been using this slogan for a long time, and a friend of mine had made up of, uh, about 100 buttons that had this slogan on it, learning disabilities, the real challenge is educating those who don't have one. And I was, uh, I was setting up to get ready to speak. I noticed in the back of the auditorium there were five or six little kids, six or seven year old kids, children with learning disabilities that went to that school, and they were setting up a bake sale. They were going to be selling cookies and things to people as they came in the door. And so I figured I'd be a nice guy, and I reached into my briefcase and took out four or five of these buttons, and I went to the back of the room and gave one of the buttons to each of the students. And there was this one little spark plug, little kid about seven years old, he was just out of his mind. He was so happy that he had the button. And he went up to his teacher and he said, look, you know that guy who made the video? Look at the button he gave me, learning disabilities. The real challenge is executing those who don't have one. <laughs> that's, that's a little more radical than we plan to get tonight, but. Teaching people about learning disabilities is a tremendous challenge. And as I work with families with special needs kids, I'm told time and time again that one of the biggest problems the families face is controlling and dealing with the behavior. And that's how we're going to spend this evening, talking about how you can control and manage the behavior of your child with a learning disability. Now, in order to do that, I have to share a bias with you. I've met a lot of parents that are very, very effective with their special needs children. I've met a lot of teachers that are very effective. And what I've done is sat down and taken all those effective parents and all those effective teachers and tried to find out what they have in common. What trait do these effective people share? But the one thing that I've found that these people have in common is this. There are three things you need to have to effectively deal with special needs children. You need to have a knowledge base. You need to know how these kids function and basically why they do the things they do. Secondly, you need to have some techniques. You need to have some sort of bag of tricks that you can draw from. 
So when you get in trouble, you can reach into that bag of tricks and, pu and pull out something from your repertoire, some technique, some strategy that you can use. And lastly, you need a philosophy. I'm talking about a philosophy system, a belief system in the way that these kids should be handled and the way they should be taught. I think that a teacher's philosophy, a parent's philosophy, ought to be just like, just like a religious faith. You don't develop a religious faith and then throw it out the window as soon as you get in trouble in your life. The reason you develop a, a religious faith is so you can have it close to you when you're, when you're in trouble. It should be the same way with a philosophy. If you have a philosophy of education, you should have it right up front. So when you get in trouble, you can pull it close and you can use it and you can utilize that philosophy. And the first thing I would suggest to you is that you need to develop an understanding of the difference between positive and negative feedback. We all know what positive and negative feedback is. Positive feedback is reward, recognition, praise. Negative feedback is punishment, taking away a privilege, doing something negative to the child. Positive feedback changes behavior. Negative reinforcement or negative feedback only stops behavior. You will not change a child's behavior by punishing him or her. You can only change a child's behavior by giving positive reinforcement. Example, I'm sitting in my office. I look out over the ball field. I see Tom picking on Jim. Tom always picks on Jim. So I bring Tom into my office, and I tell him that he can't go to recess again until he's voting age. I make him write 500,000 times, I will not pick on Jim. Not a very wise thing we do in schools. You've got half the teaching staff trying to get the kids to enjoy writing, the other half using writing as a punishment. You know, circle the slow learner in this picture. I say, you know, <laughs> You can't go to recess until your voting age. I'm going to call your mother and tell her what an awful kid you are, and I'm going to bring you down to the vice principal, and he's going to yell at you for a while. All negative reinforcement. I will guarantee you that as a result of that intervention, as a result of that negative reinforcement, Tom will never, ever, ever pick on Jim again outside my office. <laughs> but God save Jim any place else on campus, before school, after school, on the school bus, or on a weekend, because all negative reinforcement does is stops behavior. It does nothing to change the behavior. However, one day I'm sitting in my office, I look out over the baseball field, and I see Jim carrying the bases for the baseball coach, and he drops one of them. And Tom, the bully, comes over in his direction, and I think, oh great, he's gonna kick the base out of his reach, make his life miserable. But instead, much to my surprise, Tom bends over, takes the base, hands it back to Jim very nicely. I say, Tom, come here for a second. I just saw what you did. That was a very kind thing you just did. You know, as a matter of fact, I called your mother last week when you were picking on kids. I'm going to give her a call today and tell her what I just saw. And I walk down the corridor with him, and I run into the vice principal, and I say, let me tell you what I just saw him do. Let me tell you what I just saw Tom do, a very nice thing. As a matter of fact, I need to move some books down from my car. I'm going to bring him with me. He's going to come with me, and he's going to help me do a little bit of a work around here. I could use a big guy like him to help me out all positive reinforcers. I can equally guarantee you that Tom is more likely to be nice to Jim the next time he sees him, whether or not I'm around. Because positive reinforcement is an agent of change in behavior. Negative feedback only, only stops behavior. And we're supposed to be in the business of changing kids' behavior. The second thing we've got to understand if we're going to try to change children's behavior is it's not going to happen as quickly as we would like. You have to begin to deal with what we call successive approximations. You have to recognize that the behavior is not going to change this quickly. We know they don't learn how to spell as quickly as everyone else. We know that kids with learning disabilities don't learn how to read and write as quickly as everyone else. Why should we assume that they're going to learn behaviors as quickly as everyone else? I would suggest that if you're trying to change a child's behavior, you think about the way that kids learn language. Let's take a walk through the way children learn language. A little child, X number of months old, sitting in a crib. One day, the mother's walking by the crib, and the baby says, Mama! The mother goes nuts, breaks out the video camera, say it again, say it again. You call your relatives in Virginia, call the mother-in-law, you got to come over and hear her. She just said, Mama. You call your husband at work, get home right away, come home for lunch. She's saying, Mama, this is great. And the baby gets all kinds of reinforcement for saying, Mama. Four or five days later, the mother walks by the crib. The baby says, Mama. Nothing. Mama. <laughs> Nothing. Mama. Nothing. The mother looks, yeah, I've heard, Mama. What have you done for me lately? You know, you know, Mama's okay. 
The baby looks at the teddy bear and says, watch this. Da da, whoa, the camera comes out again. The other relatives come down from Maryland. You know, you call your husband, come home, you got it. The way that a child's language improves and grows is that we reinforce each step toward the goal. We don't wait until the child can recite the Lord's Prayer before we say, your language is coming along quite nicely, thank you very much. <laughs> what we do is we reinforce each step of the behavior. And as we reinforce that behavior, the behavior grows and improves. We need to understand this concept if we're trying to change a child's behavior as well. Successive approximation, reward direction, not perfection. What you've got to do is recognize reward and reinforce where appropriate the child's steps to that terminal behavior. Example, you're a teacher, you have a child with an attention deficit disorder in your class, he's highly impulsive, one of those ready, fire, aim kids that we talk about, very impulsive child, if I can't do it right, I'll do it fast, that kind of child. And whenever you say, whenever you give a, a problem in your math class, he always calls out the answer. You say, how much is three, nine, three, the kid yells out nine. And you sit down with him and you say, no, Johnny, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do, John. When I give a question in math class, I want you to raise your hand, wait till you're called on, then give the answer. You think you can do that? The kid says, yeah, I think I can do that, okay. Next day in class, you're going to class. How much is four times four? Kid goes, 16. Okay. <laughs> I would submit to you that that behavior is less wrong than the previous behavior. At least he remembered to raise his hand. I would submit to you that that behavior was less wrong than the previous behavior. So rather than saying, no, you did it wrong, you say, well, Johnny, you did remember to raise your hand. That's good. That's good. You did remember to raise your hand. But remember, raise your hand, wait till you're called on, then give the answer. Kid says, I got it. Next day in class, you come in, how much is five times five? Kid goes, 25. Less wrong, less wrong. He raised his hand and called the answer at the same time. So instead of saying, no, you're wrong, you say, well, you're, you're getting there, you're closer. You raise your hand and call the answer at the same time. Remember, raise your hand, wait till you're called on, then give the answer. Got it. Next day, you come into class. How much is six times six? Kid goes, <laughs> 36. I mean, he waited as long as he could. He raised his hand, he waited as long as he could, and he gave the answer. That is less wrong. That behavior is less wrong. Instead of punishing the child, you reinforce the steps toward that behavior. And I talk to teachers and they say, I don't have time to do that, Rick. That's like the farmer who says, I don't have time to build a fence, I'm too busy chasing the cows. You know, if you do these kinds of things, you're not going to have to deal with so much misbehavior. Successive approximations, the behavior will not come like this. The behavior will occur slowly. It will grow and develop, but will only grow and develop if you reinforce those steps toward the behavior. The other thing we need to recognize is that the behavior will be inconsistent. The research shows very, very clearly that performance inconsistency is a part of the LD profile. These kids have bad days and good days, which is why it's so difficult for them to maintain their motivation. If you're a learning disabled child, 15 years old, you have gone through the experience that I'm gonna outline for you right now, you've gone through this experience 10,000 times. You've got a times tables test. You've got a test in the times tables of five on Friday, and you wanna do as well as you can on that test. So you study on Monday and you know it pretty well. And you sit down on Monday night and you review it with your cousin. You're going through the five times tables. You got them down pretty good. You get up Tuesday morning, you practice them with your brother over the cornflakes. Five times one is five, five times two is 10, five times three is 15. You're doing okay. You practice them Wednesday morning with your father. And then Thursday morning you get up, you practice them with your mother over the French toast, you've got them pretty well. You practice them that night before you go to bed. You get up early Friday morning, put a little more practice time while you're in the shower. First period, the teacher's talking about the pilgrims, but you're just thinking five times one is five, five times two is 10, give me that test. And the teacher's second period passes out the test and you look at it and the information's gone. It's gone. You don't have the information anymore. It is absolutely gone. You fail the test. And that night when you're home watching wrestling with your brother, suddenly the five times tables come back when you don't need them. When you're a learning disabled child, you've gone through that experience thousands and thousands and thousands of times. It's called performance inconsistency. And what's so important to the ego of these kids and the self-esteem of these kids is how we as adults deal with that performance inconsistency. Because what I find is many times when a child, these kids have good days and bad days. It's part of the profile. And what I find many times is when a child's having a good day, instead of celebrating that, 
and being happy with that, we almost punish him for it. We say, well, it seems you can do it when you put your mind to it, can't you? It seems when you decide to do it, you can do this whenever you want to. It's not true. That performance inconsistency, that good day, bad day thing, do you think it's distressing for you? Imagine how distressing it is for the child. Mel Levine, University of North Carolina, said one time about performance inconsistency, it will be a great day when we recognize performance inconsistency as part of the LD profile rather than as evidence for the prosecution. Because that's what we do. When they have a good day, we say, you see, we knew you could do it. We knew you were dogging it all along instead of taking that great day, that good day, and pulling it close and using it and celebrating it and working with the child. We're going to spend a great deal of time talking about things that work. But before we do, I think it's appropriate to talk about things that don't work. We're going to talk about what I call behavioral questionable practices, things that we do with kids every day. But there's no evidence that those things work, and yet we continue to do them every day. First of all, corporal punishment. Corporal punishment. Well, we all know corporal punishment has been banned in most states in the United States now. But when I refer to corporal punishment, I talk about any physical contact with a child. You know, suppose Joanne here, I'm teaching, and Joanne's doing something. Joanne is talking to her friend Jane next to her. And I want to go over, and I'm going to grab jo Joanne by the arm, just very, very lightly, and I'm going to give her a little bit of a shake. I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm in complete control. What's missing from the formula? I don't know what she's going to do. I don't know what she's going to do. So I grab her by the arm. It startles her. She swings around and hits Jane in the nose and breaks Jane's nose with her elbow, and I'm, teaching, I'm working at Sears the next day, out of a job because that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't have grabbed the child. No, the corporal punishment, any kind of corporal punishment, folks, it just doesn't work. It doesn't work. All you do is teach the child, please, if you spank your seven-year-old constantly, don't be surprised when he starts beating on the five-year-old because he's learned that from you. He's learned that from you. Corporal punishment, stay away from it. Time out. How many of your schools use time out on a regular basis? I would be willing to bet, I consult with over 400 schools now, I would be willing to bet that if you use time out in your school, you're probably using it incorrectly. I haven't seen but two or three schools in the United States that use time out correctly. People use time out to isolate kids. Most schools use time out as a punishment. Do you know that time out was never designed to be a punishment? If you look back into the behaviorist literature in the 60s and 70s, time out was never meant to be a punishment. Time out was meant simply to be this, to take a child who's receiving positive reinforcement for negative behavior and put him in a situation where he's receiving no reinforcement for negative behavior. It's not supposed to be a punishment. The child is sitting at the reading table during reading class and he's kicking everybody under the table. Everyone's laughing, they think that's real funny. He's receiving positive reinforcement for negative behavior. You say, John, please leave the table and go sit over there in the corner where you're receiving no reinforcement for negative behavior. That's all it's supposed to be. But many schools use it as a punishment. This is one practice I love that I see at schools. Go in the corner and come out when you think you're ready. <laughs> Folks, he's totally out of control. He's disrupting your class. He's disrupting the dinner table. What makes you think he's going to make a good judgment in terms of when he's ready to come back? If you send the child to the corner, if you give your child time out, you decide when he comes back. You make that decision. I mean, in the NHL, when there's a penalty on the ice, they don't say, now you go in the penalty box and you come out when you think you can behave. <laughs> Bottom line is you're in there for three minutes. That's it. You don't come out for three minutes. That's the way if you're going to use time out with kids and you're going to isolate kids, you should decide. And only you should decide when they come out. See, a lot of people using forced apologies with kids. I don't like forced apologies. I want you to go tell Johnny that you're sorry for what you did. If he's not sorry, you're asking him to lie. I will remind a child who owes someone an apology, that it might be a good idea to apologize. But no, forced apology is not a good idea. Sarcasm, be very, very careful. Our kids don't understand sarcasm many times. They're extremely literal. They have difficulty with what we call figurative language. They're extremely literal. Be very, very careful with sarcasm. And if you decide to be sarcastic with our kids, you'd better be ready to take it back. You'd better be ready to take some sarcasm from them. I know a lot of teachers who are very free with their sarcasm when they're dealing with kids, but they don't like them being sarcastic with the teacher. Well, the door swings both ways. And the bottom line is what happens many times is you will say something sarcastic to a child, 
And he can't think of anything to say to you right away. But he thinks of something great about two weeks later, and he says it to you while you're standing in the corridor talking to the superintendent of schools. <laughs> so sarcasm, not a good idea. Taking things away from kids, confiscating goods. I know so many teachers that take great pride in the fact they pull open their middle drawer, they've got all these chattering teeth and, teeth and squirt guns and all these things they've taken away from kids. Not a good idea. Not a good idea. You see, the research very clearly shows us, research done by Kohlberg and his people, that children learn their morals and values based on what they see us do, not based on what we tell them to do. Children learn their morals and values based on what they see us do. If you're a fifth grade teacher who takes things away from kids, please don't be surprised if you find him going down to the second grade taking things away from those kids. He learned that from you. You always give the child an opportunity to get it back. You just make it more restrictive. Here's what I recommend. Jane brings in a toy, and she's playing with the toy, and it's distracting the class. I say, Jane, give me that toy, and I'll give it back to you at the end of class. At the end of class, I say, Jane, here's your toy back. Don't bring it again. She brings it again a couple of days later. Jane, I'm going to take that toy away from you, except this time, instead of giving it back to you, you have to come and get it back for me after class. You have to remember to come and get it for me. It's going to be a little bit tougher to get it back this time. She comes to get it, brings it in again. Jane, I'm going to take this down to the principal's office. You've got to go down to his office to get it back. Brings it in again. Jane, I'm going to take this away, bring it to the principal's office. Your mom or dad are going to have to come and get it back. But you're always giving the message, it belongs to you. And it would be stealing to take it away from you. So you're always going to have a chance to get it back. It's just going to be a little bit tougher each time. Cheap shots, a real questionable practice. I hate people using cheap shots with kids. I remember I was consulting at a school one time, and I heard this teacher saying to a, a child, little Charlie, Charlie was eight years old, one of our kids, difficult kid to deal with, I'm sure, and she said, Charlie, uh, I was absent yesterday, you had a substitute. Did you behave with a substitute? Charlie said, yes, I did. The teacher said, no, you didn't. I've got a whole list of things here that you did wrong. You know, you stuck the gerbil in liquor pencil sharpener, and you, you, know, you hid the chalk, and you gave a different name, and you stole the plan book. And the, the kid is looking at the teacher and thinking, why did you make me lie to you? Why didn't you tell me what you knew? See, that's what I call a cheap shot. I mean, did that teacher actually think the conversation was going to go like this? Gee, I was absent yesterday, Charlie, and uh, you had a substitute. Were you good for the substitute? Did she actually think the child was going to say, well, as a matter of fact, I wasn't. <laughs> and I, I'm quite surprised she didn't report me on this. I've got a list. I've made a list of things. <laughs> I made a list of my various transgressions here, and I think I should be severely punished. Of course he's not going to tell you the truth. He doesn't think that you know. So by setting up a cheap shot, what you're doing is you're asking the child to lie. And the last questionable practice is the one I feel very strongly about, imposing school tasks as punishment. I know, I, I've heard teachers say, you, you, the students were so bad in class today, you were so disruptive, I'm going to make you read an extra chapter in the literature book. What are we saying about how we feel about literature? Using homework as a punishment. When you're bad, you get double homework. When you're good, you don't have any homework. What are we saying about homework? We're saying homework is bad. Homework is a bad thing that you don't want to have to do. That's not what we want to teach our kids. The reality is that by using school as a punishment, using schoolwork as a punishment, we're delivering the message that school is inherently bad. So those are some things that don't work, things that we refer to as questionable practices. Let's talk about things that do. Let's talk about ways that we can discipline our children. The philosophy of the discipline model we're going to present tonight is based on this simple fact. We are too reactive with our children. We aren't proactive enough with our children. When I was running a day school, I was in the downtown area and I ran into a friend of mine who had a child that went to my school. And it was sort of a rocky father-son relationship that I shared. And so I said to him, Eddie, how are things going with Ted? And he said, ah, not too well. We're not speaking. We haven't spoken since Sunday. And I said, oh, Eddie, what's going on? What happened? He said, Rick, he said, you know, it was just one of those things. Sunday night, we sat down, we had dinner, we had a nice dinner together, and at the end of the meal, Ed, Ed, Teddy said, I'm going to run upstairs and get changed for the church dance. And he started heading up the stairs, and he said, as soon as he started going up the stairs, I said to myself, I know what he's going to do. 
He's going to put on that black leather outfit. There's no way in the world he's going to wear that to church. So I waited down at the bottom of the stairs for him. Sure enough, 20 minutes later, he came down with this black leather outfit on, and I said, you get back up those stairs, and you put on something. And we got in a big argument. We haven't spoken in three days. I said, Eddie, that was your fault because you were reactive. Why weren't you proactive? You knew he was going to put on the leather outfit. Why weren't you proactive about it? Why didn't you say, hey, uh, D -D Dad, I'm going to go get dressed for the, school, for the ch uh, church dance. Okay, but uh, Teddy, remember, not the leather outfit tonight. Ah, oh, Dad, no, 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 this is the church dance. That's okay for the school dance. Church dance, I want a pair of jeans and a sweater or something, but no leather outfit. Oh, Dad, but it's going to go a lot smoother than doing what he did, which is waiting until the child had spent 20 minutes getting himself all together and then reacting to the child's behavior. You're going to be better off if you're proactive rather than reactive. The reality is that we can take preventive measures to prevent the problems from occurring in the first place. The research, no matter what research you read, it shows fairly clearly that learning disabled kids, kids with learning disabilities, are environmentally dependent. We used to call these kids with great respect and affection chameleon kids. They take on the color of their environment. Well, if we know that the child responds to his environment, maybe, maybe, the solution to dealing with their behavior is not to try to change the child, but to try to change the environment in which the child exists. And preventive discipline is designed to set up an environment wherein the child can succeed. There is very little that you can say about all learning disabled kids. These kids are very different one from another. Not only are they different from the general population, they're very different one from the other. But if there's one thing you can safely say about most children with learning disabilities is that they have very little internal structure. We call it executive strategizing. They can't plan. They can't bring structure to their world. They can't do things in a structured and organized way. Because they have very little internal structure, it's our job to provide them with a very tight external structure, a structure that is predictable. Structure has a very, very, it's become sort of a dirty word in education now. People think of structure as being militaristic. All structure means is that it is predictable. At home and at school, your child needs to have a predictable environment. They don't deal well with surprises. They don't deal well with curveballs. You should have rules in your classroom. You should have rules, and those rules should be posted. I go into a school in February of the year sometimes, in a school where I might be consulting, and I'll walk into a school, and the third grade teacher will say, all right, everyone needs some construction paper for this project, and the classroom goes absolutely chaotic. Students crawling over desks trying to get to the construction paper. You should have a routine established for how you're going to pass out paper in the very first hour of the very first day of class. How many times in a year are you going to pass out paper? Hundreds of times a year. Are you really willing to let your class turn totally chaotic hundreds of times a year? You should have structures and routines for the way the kids pass in their homework, the way you collect the homework, what they do when they're tardy, the first thing they do when they walk into the classroom. All these things should be routinized. And this consistency will allow them to behave more appropriately. The best way for me to tell a real effective structured teacher is a day that she's not there a day that the teacher's not there. You walk into the classroom and you say to the students, well, what do you do first? Well, first we do spelling out of the, that notebook down there, and then in the middle draw, she's got the math flashcards, we do those, and then down here there's a reading group. The students feel so comfortable with that structure that they've memorized it, and that consistency, they grow to depend on it, and all the anxiety begins to decrease. Many, many of our students suffer from undiagnosed anxiety disorders. They need to have their world explained to them. They need to have their world made consistent for them. The other thing you've got to do if you're going to maintain the kid's behavior and attention is you've got to set an agenda. We've got several hundred people here today. Why? Because WETA and PBS passed out a flyer that said, Rick Lavoie is going to speak at Georgetown University. Here's who he is. Here's what he's going to talk about. Here's what he's going to say. Based on that, you all made the decision to give up an evening and come and hear this presentation. How many of you would have come if you had gotten a flyer that said, some guy from Cape Cod is going to come and talk? <laughs> <laughs> well, you just like a party, that's all. You'd come to anything. <laughs> yeah, none of you would have come. In other words, as, as adults, we insist that if I'm going to enter, if you're going to enter a learning situation, you insist, you insist that you be told what is going to be the objective and that goal and the goal of that learning situation. But we never do that with kids, do we? 
You will change the dynamic of your classroom. You will absolutely change the dynamic of your classroom by simply setting an agenda for kids, putting up on the wall what you plan to do, what you plan to talk about that day. By putting the agenda on the board, you've changed the dynamic of your classroom. Now it's, not, now it's, it's no longer you against the kids, it's you and the kids against the list. Now your allies working together, together to complete the list, they forget it's your list. They forget you're the one that put the list up there. And you can bring a sense of urgency to it. You can say, come on, guys, let's go. We're only on number three. We've got five more things to do. We've got to get going. We've only got 20 minutes left. Kids respond well to that, that kind of deadline thing. I want you to clean your room. Oh, I bet you can't do it in 10 minutes. All of a sudden, the kid's off like a rocket. You can, you can manipulate the kids. They manipulate us. You can manipulate the child by, but you know there's something the children want to do. They want to see the slides that you've got at the Washington Monument. And so where do you put that on the agenda? Where does that go? Dead last. Grandma's rule, you eat your vegetables, you get dessert. You do what I want, you'll get what you want. So starting the lesson is an important part of preventive discipline. The next step, using your voice effectively. Using your voice in a way that manages children's behavior. My bias is you never yell at a special needs child. The research shows very clearly in the field of speech and language that when you yell at a child with a learning disability, they only hear the yelling. They don't hear the message. At my school, the Riverview School, 115 adolescents with learning disabilities, I would bet that if I brought any one of the students into my office and said, you know, you're my favorite kid. You're absolutely the best kid in this school. <laughs> He'd say, what I do wrong, Mr. Lavoie? what I do wrong? They don't hear the message. They only hear the yelling. And there will come a time, God forbid, there will come a time as a parent or a teacher that you need to get your child's instantaneous response in an emergency. And I'm here to tell you that if you yell at children all the time, they will not respond when you yell at them in an emergency. Because they're so accustomed to it, they don't respond to it. Let me demonstrate for you a technique that shows how effective we can use our voice, how effectively our voice can be used. Now to do this, we need, we need two volunteers. We have two volunteers. Somebody want to do this? Uh, let's see, in the, that, in the first row back, back there, and, and you, if you would come up, please. Let me show you how we're going to do this. What we're going to do is a technique called broken record technique. This is to be used with children who argue. Now, I know none of your children argue with you, but in case a cousin or anyone comes to visit, this is a way to deal with a child who argues. There are many people in the field, and I include myself as one, who say that if you argue with a child, you automatically have lost. By virtue of the fact you're arguing, you're not supposed to argue with kids, kids are supposed to respond to us. And if you argue with a child, you've automatically lost. Why do kids argue with us? What are some reasons that kids might argue with us? Give me some reasons. One is power and control. One is power and control. The child wants power and control, and he takes it from you by arguing. The second reason the kids might argue is why? Attention, to get positive attention and reinforcement from the other kids. Because arguing with the teacher makes you look pretty cool. And the last reason the kids argue is to derail the lesson. They'd rather argue than do spelling. They'd rather argue than learn history. What we're going to do with our two friends here is I'm going to play the role of a teacher. I'm going to demonstrate a technique called broken record technique. You're going to see why it's called that. But first, I'm going to be a non-assertive teacher. This is a technique from Lee Cantor's work in assertive discipline. And I'm going to demonstrate this technique. I'm going to get involved in an argument. Again, your name, please? Sherry. Sherry. I'm going to get involved in an argument with Sherry. I'm going to be up here lecturing, and during my lecture, she's going to push her friend. You're really just a prop here today. That's all you need <laughs> to do. And she's going to push her friend. And when she pushes her friend, I'm going to get involved in an argument. What I would like you to do is to act as you think a 13-year-old would argue, change the subject, you know, try to you know, do the kinds of things that our kids do. And you'll see how ineffective it is to argue. OK, here we go. I'm going to begin lecturing. During my lecture, she's going to push her friend, and I'm going to deal with her about that. Today we're going to talk, class, we're going to talk about the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty was given to the people of the United States. Hey, don't push her. You can't push if you want. This is my classroom. She was looking at me. She wasn't looking at you. She was looking at me. You're always picking on me. You and you're always saying she does anything. Uh, but, uh, did yeah. you get? Didn't you get in trouble she's yesterday? All, she was in trouble yesterday. Stuff behind your back and you never pay attention. I was standing right here. I didn't have my back to the book. Did anybody else nothing. see? You see? I mean, is this unproductive or what? <laughs> Let's take a look at the three reasons: power and control. Who has the power and control? She does. 
Derailing the lesson? We're not getting a whole lot of social studies done, are we? Okay? And lastly, positive reinforcement? Yeah. You folks are loving that, aren't you? She's taking me to the beach. You, you're loving that. Now we're going to try a technique called broken record technique. This is the only technique that I'll give you tonight that has a guarantee with it. If, you, if it doesn't work for you, it means you're doing it wrong. That's, that's how effective this technique is. This technique it will be such an effective part of your repertoire as a parent or a teacher, and here's how it goes. Now, I'm going to do the same thing. I want, you to, I, I want you to argue with me, but I want you to stop when you think a 13-year-old kid would stop, okay? Broken record technique, watch how it works, okay? Today, we're going to talk about the Statue of Liberty. The Statue of Liberty was given to the people of France. Hey, don't push her. I saw you push her. Don't push I her. I didn't push her. In my classroom, you keep your hands to yourself. I did. In my classroom, you keep your hands to yourself. It wasn't my hand, yourself. it was my foot. In my classroom, you keep your hands to yourself. Stop. Never had to do it more than three times. Ever. Ever. Why? Take a look at the three reasons. Take a look at the three reasons. One, power and control. Who's got the power and control here? I do. I do. Okay? Secondly, positive reinforcement. Anybody laughing out there? No. In fact, you were sitting there as her appears thinking, Sherry, what are you arguing for? It takes two to tango. He's not dancing. Stop it. He's not arguing with you anymore. And derailing the lesson, boom, you're in and out of that in six seconds. Broken record technique, a very effective strategy to use because it takes away all the reasons why kids argue. And again, a very effective way to use your voice to have a calming effect on kids. Thank you very much. Thanks. We can't overestimate the effective use of praise with kids. There's some research out there now, you've probably read it, that says we praise kids too much. I can't believe that. I can't believe that you can praise a child too much. A friend of mine is a golfer. I was giving this presentation once, and he said, you know, I've played golf with the same three guys for the last 15 years. And my, I've had the same partner playing golf two times a week, two 18, uh, 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 two 18 hole uh, games every week, and for the last 15 years, and every time I hit a good shot, my partner says, hey, good shot. And it means something every time. And if he stopped saying it, I'd wonder why. You can't reinforce too much, but you want to use praise effectively. And there are some things you want to learn about the use of praise. There are two kinds of praise, descriptive and evaluative praise. Sometimes we use too much evaluative praise. If you've got a child who's 16 years old and has just learned the times tables, and you say, you're my math wizard. You're the brightest math student I've ever had. Put the math crown on your head. The kid's looking at it and say, come on, lady. Come on. My brother's four years younger than I am. He could do the times tables three years ago. My dad was doing trigonometry when he was my age. I'm too bright. Don't try to fool me. Don't tell me I'm a math wizard. Evaluative praise evaluates the performance. Try descriptive praise. That just describes the performance. I gave you 20 problems to do, and you got 19 right. That's it. I gave you 15 problems to do when you got 14 right. That's it. No evaluation, just descriptive. If you want to use praise, what you want to do is use it in a creative way. I did this one time completely by accident. I was sitting at home. I said to my wife, we worked together, and I said, I just read John's composition. It was a terrific composition. And I said, remind me to see John in school tomorrow and tell him what a great composition this was. And she said, uh, oh, you know what? You're speaking tomorrow. You have a speaking engagement. You won't be at school tomorrow. I said, OK, I'll tell him the next day. She came in a few minutes later. She said, I was thinking, John's got a uh, field trip, two-day field trip on Thursday, so you're not going to see him for almost a week. And I said, OK, I'll call him at home. So I picked up the phone. I called him. I didn't have a great relationship with John. I really didn't. And I called John. I said, hello, John. This is Mr. Lavoie. I said, what did I do wrong? <laughs> I said, nothing. I said, I'm just telling you. I'm sitting in my kitchen, and I just read your composition. It was wonderful. I just wanted to tell you how much I enjoyed it. You did a real nice job on it. My relationship with that kid changed from that day on, and I ran into him 20 years later, and the first thing he said was, remember the night you called me at home, Mr. Lavoie? I did it completely by accident, but I do it a lot now. I do it a lot now because it works. Because what you're saying is, I'm taking a moment of my time during my evening to call you at home and tell you I'm proud of you for something you did. It doesn't get any better than that. Those are the techniques you want to use in preventive discipline. Preventive discipline works. <laughs> Corrective discipline is not quite as neat and clean as preventive discipline is. It's a little bit different, a little bit, little bit more complicated, I guess. Let's take a look at what, at the basic rules of corrective discipline. Tenet number one is the teacher is primarily responsible for discipline in the classroom. The teacher is primarily responsible for discipline in the classroom. Now, that sounds very simple, but it actually, it's, it's fairly profound. 
the other kids are not responsible for disciplining the children. And that's what we do many times as teachers, don't we? We have the other children discipline the offending child. We get up in front of the class and we say, well, class, we were going to go to the media center today, but the last time we went to the media center, Tony knocked over the projector and broke the projector, so we're not going to go to the media center today. That's what I call teacher talk. What you're saying is, we're not going to go to the media center today because Tony knocked over the projector. That's what we're saying. But the message the kids are hearing is this. Would you kids do me a favor? Would you take Johnny out at recess and rub his face against the building for a while? <laughs> Because I can't do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to punish the rest of you for something he did wrong with the understanding then that you will take care of him for me. That's basically the deal we're going to make here. Collective punishments, no, no, no. No, no, no. I tell you, you want to change the dynamics in your classroom? Try collective rewards. Try collective rewards. Instead of punishing the child for what, the, instead of punishing the group for what the child has done wrong, try rewarding the group when the child does something right. You see, we have to understand, as elementary school teachers particularly, you're only visiting with those students, you know. They're a family that goes to school together for six or seven years. You're only visiting for a year. By the time you get them at fourth grade, they've been punished for what that child's done wrong for four or five years. Don't be another person to punish the whole group for what that one child does wrong. But when the child does something right, reward the whole group in the name of that child, and you'll see the dynamics begin to change. Many, many times, when we decide to punish a child, to consequence a child, the punishment we use has got nothing to do with what the child did wrong. A teacher came to my office one, one day. I was teaching graduate school at the time. She was a teacher at the school, but she was also a graduate student of mine. So I knew her in, sort of two, in two ways. And she came to me and she said, oh, Rick, Bruce can't go swimming this evening. When the dorm students go swimming, Bruce can't go. And I said, oh, really, that's too bad. Bruce loves to swim. He's a great swimmer. He's always terrific when we go swimming. Is he ill? Does he have a cold? And she said, no, but he was misbehaved in math class today. So I told him he can't go swimming. And I said, OK, you told him he can't go swimming because he misbehaved in math class. What does one have to do with the other? And she didn't understand. So I said, OK, let's try this on for size. Suppose I have you for grad in my graduate school class, plus you're also a, uh, an employee here at school. Um, suppose I were to say to you, um, suppose you passed in a term paper to me that really was not a very high quality term paper. And I were to say to you, uh, you know, I've read your term paper here and I'm very displeased with it. It's not a very good job at all. So here's what I'm going to do. You won't be paid at work for the next two weeks. Um, give me the keys to your car. Can't drive your car for a week. No red meat for a month. And no relations with your husband until you hear from me. What that teacher would say is, wait a second, no, you can't do this. You don't have the right to do this. I did something wrong in graduate school. You've got no right to step into other parts of my life to punish me for what I did wrong in graduate school. No, I don't, but neither did she. Neither did she. She had no right to take swimming away from Bruce for something he did wrong in math class because the two settings are totally unrelated. The punishment, if you're going to punish a child, it should have something to do with what the child did wrong. And what we do as parents many times is find the one thing the kid likes the best and take that away from them. We know that doesn't work in human relations. We know in a marriage that if one of the partners uses money or uses sex or uses something and holds it over the other partner's head all the time and says, you can't have this unless you do what I want you to do, the relationship falls apart. Yet we do it with kids all the time. We do that with kids all the time. We say, no, you can't. I'm going to take away the thing you want the most unless you do what I want you to do. Not a good way to deal with kids. Punishment should fit the crime. Whenever you punish a child, the punishment should be immediate and or definite. Both, if that's possible. I catch Bill writing his name in, in uh, magic marker on the, on the cafeteria table. I say, Bill, I want you to clean every cafeteria table, and I want you to do it right now. Punishment immediate and definite. If it can't be immediate, it should at least be definite. We haven't got time right now, but I want you to come down at the end of the day, and I'm going to have you wash every one of these tables. If it can't be immediate, it should at least be definite. One of the things we have got to be very, very cautious about when we're dealing with punishment with kids is to not use the punishment that I'm afraid we use more often than we should. I feel very strongly that we use a punishment with kids that is so volatile, so dangerous, and so hurtful to kids, but we continue to use it, and that is this. I think that the most painful emotion that a parent can use toward a child, that an adult can use toward another adult, that any human being can use toward another, the most painful emotion you can use is the emotion of disappointment. Think about it. Think about it. 
I'd like everyone to do something right now. Everyone right now, think of someone in your life who's very important to you, who you love, who you trust, whose opinion means a great deal to you. If they say it's right, you know it's right. If they say it's wrong, you know it's wrong. Think about a person like that. It might be your husband, wife, brother, sister. Everybody thinking of somebody in your life that plays that role? And I'll think of my wife who plays that role in my life. Would you rather have that person angry at you or disappointed in you? How many say angry? Oh yeah, oh yeah, angry. We've been together 25 years. There's, there's times she's been angry at me, but disappointed, I can count on one hand and I can tell you the dates because disappointment hurts. Disappointment says, Rick, I expected this and you gave me this. You let me down. I was counting on you and you let me down. Disappointment is so hurtful. And we use disappointment with kids all the time. I knew you'd act up at grandma's again. I knew you'd get it. I knew, I knew you said you'd improve. I knew you wouldn't. One more time you let me down. One more time you embarrass me in front of my friends. You can't do that to kids. You can't continue to hit kids with disappointment without expecting to have a long-term impact on kids. It hurts. It hurts. And don't use it. Step number five, using effective conferencing techniques. Think about it. If Bill were a teacher at my school, and I wanted to deal with Bill about something he was doing incorrectly. Think about how our conversation would go. It would go like this. I'd say, Bill, you know, you're doing a great job teaching math. I was very, very impressed. And you did a real nice job in that conference you had with Mr. and Mrs. Shefflin yesterday. That was a real nice conference. I was very, very pleased with that. But we got to talk about your recess duty. You know, you haven't been showing up for recess duty on time. It gets the kids, you know, the kids are in danger when you're not there. It's really important you be there on time. And I know you're going to turn this around, Bill, because I've seen real good things happen from you. In other words, we would begin the conversation positively, end it positively, and get our hands dirty in the middle. Give that same courtesy to your kids. Whenever you're having a conference with a child, begin it positively and end it positively. When you're dealing with kids and conferencing with kids, you not only want to think about what you want to say, you want to think about when you're going to say it and where you're going to say it. Why do we do this with kids? Why do we always pick the right time to talk to each other? Let's say you're a wife, your husband has been like a little kid. He's been looking forward years and years now to buy a boat. And he's been putting away his nickels and dimes till he finally saved enough money to buy a boat. And he's been excited about this, going to work every day with the boat catalogs, can't wait to buy the boat. And he's all pumped and excited about this. And the boat show is Saturday. And on Thursday, he goes to work with his catalogs to show all his friends about the boat he's going to get. And you take your child to the orthodontist on Thursday morning, and the orthodontist said, your child needs $2,500 worth of orthodontry, and it's not covered by insurance. The only $2,500 your family has is in the boat fund, and you've got to tell him that night that he can't get the boat. Assuming you've got to tell him in person, and you can't do it, <laughs> can't do it via email or something, I mean, how would you tell him? Would he come in the house and you'd say, hi, honey, guess what, no boat? <laughs> no. Nope, you'd wait, put the kids to bed, a little music on the stereo, a little thing, and a little Sinatra CD and a thing, a little bottle of wine, and say, honey, we got to talk. we got to talk. In other words, you would pick the right time to talk to them about it. We never do that with kids, do we? If your 13-year-old is using the phone too much, when do we talk to her about it? When she's on the phone. <laughs> we going to grab the phone and hang up the phone? No, I guarantee you'll have a better exchange with your child if you wait until the moment's right. Wait till you're enjoying the child's company, you're taking a walk on the beach and say, honey, I got to talk to you about the phone. Oh, mom, come on. No, really, you're using the phone too much and on and on and on. You're going to get a better response. You got to pick when you're going to talk to the child. You even need to pick where. I run a residential school for learning disabled adolescents. I communicate with kids all the time. If I want to make a very strong stand with a child and let him know I'm in charge, where do I hold that meeting? Where? In my office, with my stuff, with the pictures of my kids and my posters on the wall, in my office, because what I'm trying to say there is, I'm in charge and you've got to know that. If I'm, trying to have, if I'm going to have a conversation with a child and I want a real free flowing of ideas, I want to be able to discuss things with them, where am I going to have that meeting? In my office? No. Go to neutral turf. Go to the gym. Let's take a walk around campus. Let's go to the dining hall. That's not mine. That's not his. That's neutral turf. And when you do what I do for a living, you have this unfortunate duty. I got a phone call not too long ago. Rick, uh, Lindsay's uh, grandfather died. Would you please tell her that her grandfather died? So I've got to tell a 14-year-old daughter, a 14-year-old girl, that her beloved grandfather has died. Where does that conversation take place? In Lindsay's room. 
because she needs to be with her stuff. She needs to be around her stuff. She needs to be in her room to get that news. You, when you talk to a kid, you conference with a kid, you don't only have to think about, about when you're doing it, how you're doing it, even where you're doing it. The bottom line is that preventive discipline works. We know that these children respond to the environment in which they find themselves. So the key to dealing with their behavior, the key to effectively dealing with their behavior is to put them in an environment that is responsive to them and that allows them to behave. What it all comes down to, what the entire purpose of this series is, is basically our ability to work better and work more effectively with kids. And whenever anybody comes to a workshop like this, in somewhere in the beginning, middle, or end of the workshop, the speaker says, you've got to work on the child's self-esteem. How do you do that? How do you build the child's self-esteem? Well, I've come up with an analogy that I think works. In order to build a child's self-esteem and work on a child's self-esteem, I would ask you to think of self-esteem as being poker chips. Self-esteem is basically poker chips. If you've got a good self-esteem, a strong self-esteem, you've got a lot of poker chips. And if you've got a poor self-esteem, a low self-esteem, you don't have many poker chips. Simple as that. Let's talk about two children who go to the school that your child goes to. Goes to these two children go to every school in the country. One child is named Joe Cool. Joe Cool has tons and tons and tons of poker chips. How did he get all those poker chips? By good things happening to him. When good things happen to you, you get poker chips. Captain of the football team, he has 10,000 poker chips. Voted king of the homecoming dance, he has 15,000 poker chips. Get your picture in a paper for, uh, for scoring the winning touchdown, he has 12,000 poker chips. This kid's got millions and millions of poker chips. He's had, a, he's had a charmed life, God bless him. He feels great about himself and he should. Now you also lose poker chips when bad things happen to you. You go to the prom, with, Joe Cool goes to the prom with the best looking girl on campus, 20,000 poker chips. Prom night comes, he's got a pimple on the end of his nose. <laughs> he loses 3,000 poker chips, but he still has a net game, a gain of 17,000 poker chips. He's still 17,000 poker chips ahead. And this kid goes to school every day with his baskets and bags full of poker chips. And sitting next to him is Larry the learning disabled kid. Larry the learning disabled kid has poker chips like this. This is it. This is all he's ever gotten. Never been voted captain of anything. Didn't go to the prom. Never been on a team. Never got on 100 in a test. Didn't blow the top off his SATs. Didn't even take his SATs. He's got a stack of poker chips like this. And now with the inclusion movement, we make those two kids go to school together and compete against each other in the games of school. I would submit to you that that's not fair. I would submit that that's not fair. Anybody play poker here? Do we have any poker players here? Uh, sir, would you, Chris, would you, could you join me up here? Would you mind? <clears throat> Suppose, Chris, I were to say, ask you if you wanted to play poker. And I said, Chris, here's basically the deal. You're going to have this many poker chips. Okay, I'm going to have, here you go, I'm going to have all the poker chips in the Western world. I have basically 10 million <laughs> poker chips back there. I'm going to play poker against you. What would be your first response? Would you want to play? I don't think so. Okay, his first response would be, I don't want to play. What do we think the learning disabled kid is saying to us when he says, I don't want to go to school today, ma? Don't make me go. I got one of those stomach aches again, ma, don't make me go. Please don't make me go to school today. What's he saying to you? He's saying, I don't have enough chips to get in the game. I don't have enough chips, don't make me play this game. But we say to him, you gotta play. Laws, the law says you've gotta play, you've gotta go to school. So I say to you, Chris, you've gotta play poker with me. You're gonna have that many chips and I have bundles and bundles of chips back there. How would you play, Chris? Would you play conservatively or would you play recklessly? Uh, probably recklessly. Probably recklessly. He would be the one, he would be one of those that would say, I'll bet the whole thing, I don't care. That's what the learning disabled kid when he says, that's what the learning disabled kid says when he says, sure, I can walk along the edge of that building. Sure, I can try dope. Sure, I can join a, I can join a group, uh, a gang. Sure, I can do that. In other words, I'm just going to be, I'm just going to be spontaneous and do anything. I'm just going to bet the whole thing. I don't care. I don't care. I'll just bet the whole thing. Any of you, would any of you play um, conservatively? Yeah, some people are saying, I play conservatively. I just bet one chip at a time. That's what the kid with a learning disability is saying to you when he says, no, I don't want to ask anybody to the dance. Don't ask me to, ma. I don't want to put anything in the science fair. I don't want to go to summer school. I'm only going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take the chips that I've got, and I'm going to hold on tight to those, and I'm not going to let these go. And in school, we make these two kids play the game of school against each other, and I would submit to you that that's not fair. 
So in class, the first day, is, we're in class one day, and the teacher says, who was the president of the United States during the Civil War? And Joe Cool's sitting there and he's saying, I think it was Calvin Coolidge, but I'm not sure. Well, what the heck, I've got 10 million poker chips. If I get this answer wrong, it's only gonna cost me five. Uh, was it Calvin Coolidge? Teacher says, no. Larry, the learning disabled kid, is sitting there and he's looking at this little stack of poker chips. He's got 25 poker chips to his name. And he's thinking, I think the answer is Abraham Lincoln. I think the answer is Abraham Lincoln, but I just don't dare answer. I don't dare respond because I have another game I've got to play at lunch. You see, yesterday when I went to lunch, I gave the lunch lady, the one with the hairnet and the tattoo, I gave the lunch lady, I gave the lunch lady a $20 bill and she only gave me change for a 10. And my father said, don't you come back without that extra $10. You go to that lady and you tell her she gave you the wrong change. And he's thinking, that's gonna take me 25 chips. It's gonna take 25 chips for me to go and ask that lady for my money back. So I don't dare play in this game because if I lose the chips, I won't have enough to play in the game I've gotta play at lunch. And the teacher says, the right answer is Abraham Lincoln. And Larry goes, oh, I should have done it. I should have done it. The reality is that the self-esteem of our kids, the problem with the self-esteem of our kids is they just don't have enough poker chips. The solution is to give them poker chips. How do you give kids poker chips? How do you build their self-esteem? One is you find, if you're a parent or you're a teacher, you find the island, what, what Bob Brooks calls the island of competence. You find the one thing that that child can do well and you make a big deal out of that. You celebrate that, you make that very important. If you're a mom and the only thing your child knows how to do is use a Phillips head screwdriver, every Thursday before he gets off the bus, you loosen every bloody screw in the house. <laughs> and when he gets off the bus, you give him the screwdriver and you say, go to it, pal, because nobody does it like you. <laughs> you gotta be a talent scout, you gotta find things he does well. You gotta find, because every time you praise a child, every time you say, that was a good job, you're giving him poker chips. Parenting is pretty simple. Being a teacher is pretty simple. It all comes down to this. Your job is to make sure that every child you deal with has more poker chips when he goes to bed that night than he or she had when they got up in the morning. That's it. It's that simple. And how do you make sure they have poker chips? You give as many poker chips as possible. Secondly, you take away only as many poker chips as necessary. Please listen to me, dads, because we dads are real good at this. Let's say that Chris is my son. And Chris is sitting in class, sitting at the dinner table. Want to cup your hands like that for me, Chris? Chris is sitting at the dinner table, and he's got that many poker chips. He's got that many chips. And we're sitting at the dinner table, and, and uh, Chris spills his milk. And I say, you know, Chris, sometimes you make me sick. You know, do you get up at 5 o'clock in the morning and say, how can I spoil Dad's day? Is that what your problem is? You're the only one in the family who does this. Sometimes I even wonder why we have you in this family. Go to your room. And he goes up to his room. And the rest of the family sitting there, oh boy, oh boy. And I sit there and I think, oh boy, that was pretty rough. That was pretty rough on old Chris. That's pretty tough on Chris. I wasn't really mad at Chris. I was mad at my secretary. So I should go apologize to him. So I go up and I sit in the edge of Chris's bed and I stroke his hair and I say, gee, Chris, I'm sorry, pal. I shouldn't have yelled at you that way. I shouldn't have yelled at you that way. That was wrong. That won't happen again. Sorry, Dad. Sorry, Dad. Yelling at him in front of the family, telling him you wish he wasn't in the family, Tell, ask him if he plans how to spoil your day, telling him you're basically sick of seeing him when you come home from work. You took away 50, 60,000 poker chips from him. Sit in the edge of his bed, stroke his hair, tell him you love him, 5,000 poker chips at the most. You're still 55,000 55, poker chips behind the eight ball. You can't do that with our kids. You can't take away those massive number of poker chips without realizing that you're making your job as a parent much tougher. And lastly, you've got to give as many as you can, take away only what's necessary, and lastly, you've got to be willing to go to the mat with people who take poker chips away from your child and not give any back. Teachers take away chips, bus drivers take away chips, principals take away chips, but most of us also give chips back. And if you take poker chips away from a kid, but then give some back, that's okay, there's a lot of people in your child's life who play that role. But the bottom line is, if there's someone in your child's life who is taking poker chips away and not giving any back, they're making your life much tougher. When are we gonna deal with this? That's what advocacy means. Standing up for someone who can't stand up for themselves. If you're a teacher or a parent, you've gotta be willing to go to the mat with people who take chips away from your kid and not give any back. You're a mom, you get up in the morning, you make them French toast. Oh man, 20,000 chips. <laughs> you lay out his favorite clothes, a Beavis and Butthead t-shirt that he loves and you hate, 15,000 chips. 
you put his books at the door ready for him to go out the door, 10,000 chips. You warm up the maple syrup, oh my God. <laughs> you warm up the maple syrup, another f Hey, don't push her. I can push by one. You can't push if you want, this is my classroom. She, was looking at me. she wasn't looking at you, she was looking at me. Do you ever have days when the kids seem totally out of control? Didn't you get in trouble yesterday? She was in trouble yesterday. You see? I mean, is this unproductive or what? When adults argue, we play by the rules. Kids don't. It's like gorilla arguing. Our kids, kids don't play by the rules. Educator Rick Lavoie will help change your child's behavior by changing your behavior at home and in school. Parents and teachers, join us for when the chips are down with Richard Lavoie. Funding for this program is made possible by the members of WETA. From the campus of Georgetown University, please welcome Rick Lavoie. I was speaking in North Carolina not too long ago and I was flying back from North Carolina heading into Boston and you know you're sitting in the back of the plane and coach and you're, you've paid for 18 inches of space, it's like your little world and you kind of sit there protecting it, hovering over it. The gentleman next to you could be having a heart attack, you wouldn't even notice it, you're just kind of sitting there doing your work. So I reached into my briefcase and opened up my briefcase and took out some educational journals I had, dropped the tray table down and took out some note cards and started taking some notes from these journals. And there was a middle-aged gentleman sitting right to my left and he leaned over into my space and saw what I was doing and he said, excuse me, he said, are you in education? And I said, yes, I am. And he said, do you have any children of your own? And I said, yes, I do, I have three. And with that, it was very strange, it was almost mystical. His eyes kind of glazed over and he looked out the window of the plane, not focusing on anything, and said half out loud and half to himself, I didn't even know if he was talking to me. He said, God, I wish I had three kids. I'd give anything to have three kids. And I said, don't you have any children, sir? And he said, yes, I have six. <laughs> the... <laughs> For more information about learning disabilities, visit LD Online, a WETA website at www.ldonline.org. Funding for this program is made possible by the members of WETA.